This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello and good evening. Welcome to tonight's Twilight Show with me, Hannah Wilson. Tonight I'm going to be joined by Jim Roebuck, and we're going to be talking about changing roles to support a better work-life balance. Do you need to step sideways or step backwards in order to enjoy teaching again? Feel free to comment or call in and ask your questions. This is Teachers Talk Radio and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Introducing Eton X from Eton College, a diverse range of quality online courses enabling young people to inspire and excel. Designed for self-study, these web-based courses empower your students with essential leadership, communication and academic skills for success at school and beyond. Our study skills course sharpens their learning abilities, while the AI Fundamentals course equips them with vital digital know-how in a fast-changing world. Other popular courses include verbal communication, critical thinking, writing skills, resilience, creative problem solving, and many more. Offer the Eaton X curriculum in your school for free. Visit EatonX.com to find out more. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The mother of murdered schoolgirl Brianna Jai has spoken about the need for positive change and a lasting legacy for her daughter. Mrs Jai visited Westminster as part of her campaign for mindfulness to be taught in all schools in England. She commented on her Peace and Mind UK Facebook page that her focus would be to improve lives by empowering people, giving them the tools to build mental resilience, empathy and self-compassion through mindfulness. She went on to say that she hoped to create more understanding for everyone. Mrs Jai has already raised thousands of pounds to deliver mindfulness training in schools in her local area. The Department for Education has said there were no plans to introduce mindfulness, but the RSHE curriculum included a strong focus on mental health and that all schools had been offered grants to train a senior mental health lead by 2025. Mrs Jai has also spoken about the idea for a phone for under 16s to limit access to social media apps. The Children's Commissioner, Dame Rachel D'Souza, told the BBC that she supported the ideas and said more could be done to promote phones that are safe by design. She described Mrs Jai's vision as really smart, but questioned whether the likes of Google and Apple would create phones with access that is safe by design. PM Rishi Sunak has stated that the new Online Safety Act is robust, but parents told the BBC how difficult it is to take away a smartphone from a child who already has one, whilst others described the pressure from social media as relentless. In Wales, the cap on university tuition fees is rising from £9,000 to £9,250 a year from September. Education Minister Jeremy Miles says he recognises students will be disappointed. A report on the BBC News website says loans will also go up to cover the 2.8% increase, which will affect undergraduate students studying in Wales whose home address is in Wales. Those with a home address in Wales but who study in other parts of the UK are unaffected because they already pay the £9,250 for their studies. 
Mr Miles blamed sustained inflationary pressure on high education providers in Wales and that the increase was unavoidable, but would help to safeguard provision and investment. The Guardian reported on school finances with an article on findings that almost half of multi-academy trusts in England were in deficit last year. The report by the accountancy network Creston UK was based on studying the accounts of 279 trusts, representing over 2,300 schools. It found 47% were running in-year deficits. Rising energy bills and staffing costs were blamed by many and made worse by uncertainty around income streams. School leaders say that schools are constantly asked to do more with less. Last October, the Department for Education in England admitted to making a £370 million error, meaning mainstream primary and secondary schools will be given at least £50 less for each pupil than original forecasting predicted. This forced school leaders to redraw their budgets for 2024 to 25. With energy costs still high and a recruitment and retention crisis leading to an increased use of agency staff, mean that many school leaders are facing further pressure on budgets and many expect a deficit trend to continue. More than 100 school buildings containing dangerous concrete will be rebuilt or refurbished, according to a report on the BBC. The government says all affected schools will receive funding to permanently remove the dangerous concrete known as RAC. Unions say the announcement includes no new money. The 234 schools affected in England have reportedly returned to face-to-face -face learning, but many children are still being taught in marquees, portable classrooms or in other off-site locations. Some pupils have not been able to access specialist classrooms for design and technology, as well as science labs and other specialist spaces. The government has been criticised for not making changes to exams for those affected. Finally, a jury in the United States of America has held the mother of a 15-year-old mass shooter criminally responsible for the death of four high school students in 2021. The 15-year-old himself was sentenced to life without parole in December, but at the start of February, the male's mother was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. The first time a parent has been convicted of such charges due to their child's role in a mass shooting. The case has raised questions about the accountability of parents. Although the youth's parents had gifted him the weapon days before the attack. Prosecutors also argued that parents had not paid enough attention to their son's declining mental health. US law generally only holds individuals responsible for their own actions, but this case appears to present some change. The schools where the shooting took place has also faced criticism for not acting swiftly when drawings of guns were found on the mail earlier in the day of the shooting. Whatever the outcome of the sentencing, the case appears to be reinvigorating debate around the issue of parental responsibility, alongside individual culpability. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Thank you, Joe Fox, there with our news for this week. And actually, it's quite interesting with um, one of the regular headlines in our news being teacher retention. And I think uh, Tom tweeted out earlier in the week that it's about 40,000 teachers every year that are leaving the profession. So I've got Jim joining me tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about kind of changing roles and supporting a better work-life balance. Um, Jim, if you want to unmute yourself and kind of introduce yourself, that would be great. Thank Hi, you. Hi, Hannah. Yeah, thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? I can indeed. Great. Yeah. So my name's Jim Roebuck. Um, my sort of brief version is my background is in uh, primary education. I've spent 20 years um, working as a teacher and deputy head teacher in uh, some different London primary schools. Uh, and I have just made the move uh, this academic year in September into a teacher training role with a multi academy trust, which has been quite a change. And, and what kind of made you decide to to do that change? Because um, it's not a normal uh, move. It's something that I, I've recently done a similar thing. I've kind of stepped backwards, but I've done stuff in terms of teacher training and things like that. So um, I understand the realms of it. Um, but I think it's, it's difficult in teaching. You always feel like you have to project upwards and nobody actually talks about sideways. 
Yeah, so I mean, I think the obvious route for me for a long time seemed like going for a headship, um, and I was uh, deputy for 13 years altogether in the end, So, uh, and I'd done my MPQH and things, uh, but it never quite felt like the right time to take on that extra responsibility um, and, and take on the big job for one reason or another, um, often personal life, but also professionally I was feeling sort of I was doing well in the deputy role and, and didn't feel the, the kind of impetus to make a change. Um, but I think over time, it was just sort of building up this sense that I'd kind of wanted a new challenge. I wanted something different to do. Um, and I didn't feel like there was space in my life for that challenge to be a headship. Um, and then there were some sort of home factors playing into it as well. So um, I've got two young children and my youngest was due to start school. Um, in September and that was going to um, play havoc with all of our kind of um, life arrangements around childcare and things um, and I realised that if I carried on sort of working frontline in schools that the um, it was going to prove really difficult to have the flexibility that I needed to support with that so just simple things like being able to be um, there to drop drop the kids off in the morning or, um, or be able to go go along to um, uh, you know events after school easily and things were going to become quite challenging working the school. I, ironically, it's one of the hardest environments to work in to get that flexibility you need to be a parent sometimes. Um, so yeah, I, I think they, they were the kind of the main factors. Um, and there was a little bit of serendipity in there as well, just in that, um, you know, when I got to a point where I was looking in that direction, the particular role that I've ended up in was advertising and um, it was just sort of right, right person, right place, right time, I suppose. And you've got quite an interesting one when you talked about kind of your parental leave um, as well, because you you took 12 months out. And I, I completely agree with you um, in terms of how teaching, even though teaching seems great because you're a teacher and your kids are in school and you have the school holidays off and everyone thinks it's really great. But actually, there's a lot of kind of the after school stuff as well. So and actually, you don't have that flexibility to go and see your kids unless you've got a really great supportive kind of school you don't get to go do school pickups or go do sports day or the play and things like that so it's it is harder than I think potentially public perceived teaching to be um kind of present in those normal ways that society kind of deems it yeah no exactly there's this sort of wider perception of uh, you know being able to have that flexibility when the school day ends at 3 30 but if your children are in a different school however accommodating and flexible your school as an employer is getting from your school to their school in time to pick up is just not practical um and i really felt for my eldest child who's uh, she's in year two now uh, i really felt that I, I was missing out on being part of her school experience uh, you know i didn't get to know any of the other parents um from her, uh, her class um i didn't feel like i could get into the school very often and i had this real sense that i was missing out on that part of it um and yeah as you say the the, the other um sort of un, I, I suppose relatively unusual thing although i think it's becoming increasingly common these days is is um the parental leave um my wife and i made the decision um when the second child was coming along that i would take um the year's parental leave um rather than uh her um which proved amazing actually a, a really kind of a fantastic experience in a lot of ways but very eye-opening as well because um going from kind of having been working full time uh, really my whole adult life to suddenly finding myself in this existence um, as a as a stay at home dad effectively for the year with a very young uh, son was um, was quite a shock to the system in a lot of ways um, and uh, I, I really kind of um, felt quite isolated at times within it as well because uh, it, it's almost the polar opposite to school uh, life where you're kind of constantly interacting with people, children, uh, staff, um, colleagues, parents, all throughout the day. Your whole day is characterised by these kind of interpersonal interactions and then suddenly stepping into this home environment, um, which coincided with COVID as well. So, uh, um, you know, we had the kind of the lockdown thing going on. Um, I think sort of it was initially fantastic, but after a few months, I think a bit of bunker mentality started setting in and it, it uh, I, I was really really keen when I did get the opportunity to start doing days back in work as a sort of a keeping in touch thing um, I, I was really keen to get back to doing that I, I was quite I found it really hard to adjust when I um, went on my maternity leave and I was one of those crazy people I worked right up to my due date because my due date was the 4th of January so I went in on the inset day on the 
4th of January. So I'd get paid for the Christmas holidays. Um, I think I got to about lunchtime and they were a bit worried I was going to pop in the middle of inset and sent me home. Um, at which point I then proceeded to drop my box of celebrations that they got me all over the floor and I couldn't reach them and had to wait hours <laughs> before somebody would pick them up, came home and pick them up for me. Um, but I just felt that I was working quite late before I went on maternity. I was working to like six, seven o'clock trying to set everything up for kind of make sure everything was in place whilst I was away. And I think it was actually going on that maternity and stepping away from the classroom that you realize it won't collapse without you. It will go on. And, and I had some health issues last year as well, where I had a pulmonary embolism and ended up in, in hospital. And again, I took my laptop with me so I could write all my cover and like write, make sure like I could do everything from home and stuff while I was ill. But it's you feel this kind of responsibility for the kids that you're teaching in the school that you're kind of in. It's really hard to kind of sometimes to let go, but also it's quite a revelation to almost realise it will go on without you. You don't have to work yourself to the bone but it will they will cope and survive regardless and it's that for me was quite a big kind of eye opener of like stopping and stepping away and it will all go on fine without you yeah i i i had very much the same sort of experience of it being quite eye opening to see you know how how well the school thrived without me i suppose um because as as deputy head you kind of um involved in so much of the running of the school um, and you feel like you're playing this really central role, which you are, um, you know, supporting people, uh, organising things, making sure things happen. Um, but actually, you know, I was really fortunate to be supported by a really good, you know, good quality senior, wider senior leadership team with some fantastic assistant heads and one of them uh, sort of stepped up uh, into the deputy role for the year. Um, and actually, it was, it was really refreshing because, uh, you know, I, I was keeping in touch with the head and the school through throughout leave. But, you know, there, were, there was never any sense that they were kind of desperately in need of me to go back right now or anything. Um, and, yeah, as you say, you kind of realise it's fine. I don't have to panic quite that much about, um, you know, that sense of guilt you have when you can't go in at some point. You know, schools are resilient places, especially well-led schools are resilient places and they find a way. Yeah. And I, like when I was sick as well, I even remember messaging the kids and being like, I, I, my first week, first couple of weeks back being like, I don't think I can manage the after schools as well, because I'm still not quite 100 percent. And the kids emailing me going, Miss, we, we want you to be OK. We're more worried about you. We'll be all right. <laughs> and it's that kind of like you just feel such a responsibility to them that you worry that you're letting them down. But actually looking after yourself and you being healthy and well balanced and mentally strong is actually giving them a bit more than kind of battling through and giving them half of yourself by not kind of having your best self. Yeah, we're, we're terrible for being martyrs as a profession, I think, aren't we? We kind of, we, we feel this, such this sense of loyalty um, and, and commitment to the children we work with that um, the, the, the thought of them not having us there for them is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's powerful motivator to kind of get you to drag yourself in when really you should be taking time to rest and uh, and be yourself. And I, it's one thing that always used to drive me nuts as well as a school leader. If I had a teacher come in who was clearly not well enough to, to, to be there and should be at home resting, but they'd felt this sense that they ought to come in and you think, no, you're, you're making it harder for, uh, you know, us to run the school smoothly because we've got to send you home now and, and your kids will manage. They'll be fine for a day or two with someone covering and things. We'd rather you look after yourself. Um, but yeah, it's quite hard when you're that person who feels that sense of responsibility to kind of make peace with that and say, no, it's OK, I'm going to step away and take time for myself. I think I, th I think I was, I was uh, chatting to one of the other hosts the other night and she wasn't very well, felt slightly better and then noticed the other teacher had gone off. So felt she had to go in, but arranged a doctor's appointment to see them. And then they had the audacity to ask her to move it to after school time and then couldn't. And then emailed the person covering going, you've now got to cover this person because they can't move their hospital, their doctor's appointment. And I'm just like, but they've ill and they tried to come in, but they still they've been ill for a while this cough that just won't go away that's going around and and like they need medical attention that you can't criticize somebody for kind of giving their all and I think that's the same with kind of parentally it's it's great that you've taken the whole year I certainly kind of I mean I I did the tactical thing in the fact that my son was born in January and I popped back in July um and then had the summer and then was back um, I, I dropped down a day so I did four days from September but that was 
that was kind of my thing that if I went back earlier, then I do a day less. So I still get that time with my son kind of in a longer capacity for that year. Um, but I just think there's you, we as teachers put so much pressure on ourselves to kind of rush back and not stop and kind of enjoy that time at home whilst we've got it. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, for, for me, I kind of made the decision at the start that it was going to be a full year, that I was just going to kind of take the plunge, go for it, make be clear with my head teacher that that's what my plan was. And then he we could kind of plan a school year and the school development plan around the, you know, that that's being the situation for the year. So that that was nice as well, because that released any sense of pressure I had might have otherwise felt to get back sooner. You know, I, I knew there was a plan in place to run the show for that year and things. Um, although as it happened, you know, it, it falling during COVID and things, it was a really, I, you know, it was a much more challenging time than I think the, uh, the, the head and I anticipated when we first talked about uh, the, what was happening. And I think like what you said about kind of the keeping in touch days, I think some people don't necessarily always know about those, but I think you get about 10 in total and they're definitely worth kind of using and coming back in and rebuilding that kind of, that gradual step of coming in um financially they're quite good for when your maternity leave kind of or paternity kind of drop down in terms of pay um but they're quite good in kind of building that moment where you've then got to almost unattach yourself to your child and try and go back into work um but certainly for me it was it was it was it was quite nice though I didn't really want to admit it but it was quite nice actually kind of going into work and having adult conversations I think like you said it gets to a point where you feel like you spend all day with with these kids and and it's lovely spending that nice quality time with your little bean um but it gets to a point where actually it's quite nice to have those adult conversations and get your brain kind of ticking in a in a in a different way again. And but rather than kind of going straight into it and having that massive shock hit you of being like, oh my gosh, I'm back into like a full timetable and all the chaos of school, using those keeping in touch days can really help ease you back in rather than it being this sudden like kind of massive adjustment. Yeah, do you know, I think those 10, um, 10 keeping in touch days, that the, the time I took those were some of my sort of favourite points of my career in a way. Um, because as you said, it was that kind of, you know, I'm back in the world of uh, interacting with adults. The intellectual stimulation that I'd started really craving, you know, suddenly I had some things to get my teeth into. Um, I took them over 10 weeks. It was the last 10 weeks of my, um, of, the last 10 school weeks of my um, leave. And the head had kind of thought, you know, he, he he knew what he wanted to be done in terms of there was some curriculum leadership stuff he wanted looking at. So I had this, you know, these, these visit days where I'd go in, I'd meet with people and talk about the curriculum. I'd get to do some kind of curriculum overview and planning, the sort of stuff that you'd never get time to really dedicate time to um, in the normal busy running of things. But because I was this sort of extra body uh, while the school was sort of doing all the day to day running itself, it really worked. Um, and, and for me, it was just fantastic because I was feeling intellectually engaged. Age. I had that little break away from home, but I still had significant amounts of time being at home with um, with my son and things. Um, and uh, yeah, it really gave me a taste, I think, for part time working, which I think is um, you know part of the reason why I've ended up uh, in the role I'm in at the moment as well is is wanting to look for something that's uh, is, is not full full time. Yeah, I think um, you spoke earlier as well about that kind of flexibility in terms of pickups and drop-offs and things like that I always felt um when my son started um school he'd been at nursery um obviously before that um he went to nursery three days a week and my mum had him two days a week um on the lead up to to starting in reception um but my son um has a speech delay he's deaf so he goes to um a different school he was in an SRB so he'd have um daily speech therapy at this school and there's 10 kids from different schools in the area that are all kind of taxied in um because it's out of we're slightly out of catchment um and when I but um, I only found out literally kind of two weeks before he was due to start because um, they would tell us what time he was going to be picked up. So I literally found out two weeks before the start of the year that um, he was um, the last to be picked up and therefore wouldn't be picked up till quarter past eight. And my school starts at half eight and is 20 minutes away. So I was like, I can't do this. So I, I arranged for the school for him to be in breakfast club. But they said they wouldn't allow for him to be in breakfast club 
Nobody from the breakfast club could walk him to the taxi when they arrived and nobody from the taxi could come out and press the button to collect him from breakfast club. So uh, I called it the two, it was about kind of a hundred metre no man's land where no one would work my child. Um, And I remember the teacher kind of almost saying when I rang up and said, look, I, I can't, I can't remove myself from lesson one. I'm a single mother. If I can't teach lesson one every day, that's that's me dropping down 20 percent of my wages. So that's not physically possible. My school can't cover me for kind of 15, 20 minutes of every day. And like I'm just asking for somebody to walk him from breakfast club to the taxi um, or even like the taxi ringing and letting him out. I'm like, he's a good as gold. He's one of the best behaved kids I know. And he, he quite happily walked from that door to, to the taxi. And they were like, oh, but he might have a tantrum or cry and refuse to get on the taxi. That's not our responsibility. And I completely understand that. But they kind of said that before they'd met him. And then they also said that I was a bad mother for putting him in two settings at such a young age. And I was like, but I'm also a single working mother. I I don't have the option. I have all the time in the world in the holidays and will spend all those days with him. But I don't have the option to um, be there. So I, I my school very nicely let me have the first two kind of weeks off. So I did literally dropped into breakfast club, sat in my car, waited for the taxi to arrive and then we go walk to to the door and walk him to the taxi to prove that he was fine to get on and wouldn't be um a problem and then after that they were absolutely fine with it um but for me i just felt like such a bad mum kind of putting him in those different situations and putting him in after school club um on the upside to the taxi was some days the taxi would get back at the same point as I was able to get back if I didn't have after school um CPD or anything I could actually meet the taxi um but it was kind of that kind of you feel guilty because you're not there like you said at breakfast uh, pick up and drop off I didn't meet any of the other uh parents so I felt quite isolated in that respect and you'd th- think as a teacher having t- school hours you would it would work quite well but I just never got to, until I got sick I never picked him up from school um and I just find that quite bizarre but that's one of the reasons I've moved so I've taken a step back so I've gone from national subject lead and head of department to just being an art teacher but the sc- the job came up where I um live and where my right next to my son's school speech school uh, so he doesn't have to get he rather than get in the taxi he gets in the car with me and I drop him off um, but my school finishes slightly early on a Monday and slightly earlier on a Friday. So on those two days, I can walk around and pick him up and meet him at school. And one day I have a free and they said, we really value parent life. You can go pick him up. It's your PPA time. We don't mind. And already just from January, the mental kind of joy that I get from being able to go pick him up and not feel like a rubbish parent that never meets his teachers other than on like a Zoom call. Uh, it's just done so much for my well-being. So I just think there's we, we love our jobs, but sometimes our, 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 our own kids have to be in the equation as well. Yeah, definitely. There's it's that the, the parent guilt and the teacher guilt sort of competing with each other and feeling like you've got to you've got to choose to let somebody down. And it, um, it's it's a kind of a deficit way of thinking about it, I suppose, really. You know, it's it's unrealistic for us to expect of ourselves that we're going to be perfect in either role. Something's got to give. Um, but yeah, for, for me, having a role where I feel like I can definitely put my family first has been, you know, immeasurably good for my well-being. Um, for me, it was always, um, I, I would worry that I didn't get to do reading with my daughter after school because by the time I'd kind of finished at school, and gone and picked her up from her after school club and things and got home we were getting on for dinner time and there was sort of barely any time in between to sit down and sort of create the environment you want to have to uh, get a relaxed reader to start to read and things um, and um, it's become so much easier now having the um, the, the role I'm in now where uh, you know I often can pick her up at the normal end of school day and just having an afternoon and evening where there are you know a few hours for us to spend together as a family rather than this kind of condensed um stressful hour hour and a half two hours of having to cook do bedtime do bath all of the things that you're desperately trying to fit in um and you know the the positive is having moved job i no longer have the guilt that i'm letting anybody else down by doing that because the uh, the, the job i'm in at the moment um very much i've got the flexibility to sort of choose the hours that i go in spend in school working with trainees or um or, or 
in meetings and things um, and I can fit that around family life in a way that just works so much better. Are you still there Hannah? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah, I couldn't a second okay. ago. Okay, it just cut. It just cut out for a moment. Sorry. Can you just repeat that bit that you just said? Yeah. So I was I was talking about sort of the um, the difficulty of um, fitting in things like the uh, reading with my daughter and things in the evenings in the the short time that I had between finishing school when I was in the school based role and and bedtime and uh, and how much of a um, uh, how refreshing it is and how good for my well-being it is to not have that sense of guilt that I'm having to trade one of my roles off against the other. Um, the role I've got now allows me that flexibility to set my own hours and things. And so I can kind of, um, you know, wrap things up for a day in time to pick her up and um, come home and have a good few hours at home to be more relaxed as a family before I go to bed without feeling, without, before I put the kids to bed rather, without feeling that uh, I'm letting anyone down at work or not getting things done that I should be getting done there. And and do you think there's space for that, more of that in kind of education? Because we're very much set that like we must have teachers that work kind of full time on these days I think a lot of schools are kind of reluctant to have part-time teachers or if you do get the magic kind of part-time teachers where this teacher that teaches a little bit of this on this day and a little bit of that on that day then it makes timetabling very difficult or if you lose a teacher that does the little bits that fill in the gaps from the other people being part-time then and they happen to be skilled across multiple subjects then it leaves the recruitment process really difficult because you're trying to find somebody that's got the same kind of skill set and they it's harder to tick those boxes across multiple subjects but i just feel like there's just such a especially with the recruitment like issues and keeping and retention issues that this kind of loophole that actually if we kind of encourage more kind of part-time work is going to be better for teachers mental health but actually um, it could keep people in the profession longer? I think it's really difficult for schools because, um, I mean, I, you know, I, th I think about this from a, a primary school perspective. Obviously, that's where my background is. And the um, the importance of children having this sort of stable figure as their teacher who's there for them every day and throughout the day and that things are, you know, uh, things work in a kind of a routine way and they know what to expect that the the, the, um, the security that that gives them is so crucial to allowing them to thrive but the implications of that for um, the, the management of the school are you know push you towards this very rigid model of well then we must have a full-time teacher in every class who is with those children all of the time um, and as you say uh, finding people who can work within the school in a way that will uh, you know can go and cover colleagues to allow them to go and do a pick up or whatever at the end of a school day finding that person who can do that and, and be just as effective I mean for secondary you're talking subjects but for primary someone who can go and do that with reception and and then go and do it in in year six uh, later the same day and things very very difficult to find um, and those are difficult jobs to do as well because um, you, you know you're, you're always picking up somebody else's classroom somebody else's routines um, uh, trying to work with those and uh, build relationships with lots of different children rather than having the the one class that you get to know really well as a primary school teacher but I think the the situation the profession is in with recruitment and retention is uh, and and the wider kind of work climate that's out there now of increased flexibility um, you know more more working from home options available there are a lot more roles out there for teachers to look at as alternatives that will offer them uh, afford them that flexibility and I think if we don't have a reckoning with it as a profession and, and think about ways we can organize our, our schools to try and allow for more flexibility um, I think we're really going to suffer um, down the line in terms of you know the numbers of people that we've got leaving the profession um, and how hard it is to recruit really good quality teachers now. And um, going with your kind of new role, um, do you think there should be options to kind of do your teacher training kind of part time and spread it out? Because I feel like I always say to my trainees that your teacher training year is probably the hardest you'll ever work in teaching 
um because you've got to do all your lesson plans and all your planning and prep and everything and you don't know the students and you're in different places it's it's so much to take in in what feels like a really short space of time especially by the time like the first time terms kind of getting your feet and then second term you're kind of getting there and then third time term you're you're up and running but then they it cut short like they're finished in june um do you think there should be kind of an option to take it a bit longer but at a slower pace that i think the training year is is all when you put it into a year like that it's always going to be incredibly intense and and whatever stage we've been through the year i've always been really mindful of what it will be feeling like for my trainees so you know that start of the year where they're being bombarded with all this information about safeguarding and inclusion and behavior management and planning and assessment and so much information uh, that's hitting them um at the start in that, that intensive training and practice at the start of it then they're straight into school and that kind of particularly for people who haven't worked in schools before for the intensity of working in schools is quite a surprise I think for a lot of people when they get there um, then you've got things like uh, you know university assignments kicking in you've got um, you know the, the teaching load starting to ramp up through the year uh, now I'm at the point where my trainees are going out to their broader school experience so they're going to a completely different school so they're going to have to take on board a whole new set of, uh, of policies of approaches a different culture just go through the emotional experience of coming out of the place where you're feeling comfortable and settled now and, and being in a different place I think it's loads it's absolutely loads we demand on them and I I'd look ahead to the summer term and think, well, you know, they're going to be teaching kind of, you know, 80, an 80 percent timetable on the, the, the four days there at, in school. You know, that's that's pretty much doing what an ECT is doing, plus, you know, having their assignments and things to do on the outside of it. Um, I, I, it I find it very hard to see a, re, a good reason why you wouldn't want to try and stretch that out a little bit more in an ideal world. Now, you know, I understand people can't necessarily afford to take two years off off work or whatever, to, but, but it would afford for uh, allow for, you know, part time time approaches you know they could still be working in a different part-time role if if they had one and and, and, a, and a more kind of hybrid approach but I can't see any good reason why the content that we're covering this year in terms of what we're uh, what we're delivering to them about being a great teacher and, and learning the craft of teaching I can't see any good reason why that couldn't happen over a longer period of time um, but there definitely seems to be a paucity of options out there for people who are looking for a part-time route into teaching. And I, th I did um, my first master's, I did it full time, but there was an option to do it part time. And we were the first year that did this specific um, course. And I had half my lectures with the part time students. And then um, I was unfortunately, the, for some random reason, the only person doing it full time. And um, so my other lectures were with other full time um, students from other courses. It was it was in the arts, but. I, I I kind of I like the fact that it was still that mix like the people that did it part time were actually quite a lot of them were teachers so they were doing it um kind of on the side of their job um and upskilling themselves but it was it was just meant that they could they could still go and teach and so they could still have their job on the side but they still got everything out of the course they just took it at a slightly slower pace and I feel like that could work with teaching especially um kind of just spread it out but they could still have the lectures with the full-time students but then just some other ones are kind of added in for the full-time kind of to get them there quicker but it's still supported and I just think if because a lot of this I, I, I did do a show I'm, I really wish I could reel off the stats now I've forgotten them but there's a, a large number of um, people that qualify and then just quit the profession because it was just too hard or especially retaining after ECTs I think it's the first five years that a lot of people then um, leave the profession but I just we need to be doing something that's kind of supporting them and and I think also that's that idea isn't it that the ECT years are really important but um, and again, it's that thing that, oh, well, if you don't do those first few two years full time, then you're going to take three, four years to become an ECT. Um, but there's lots of other experience they're gaining during that lengthy time. But I do think we should have kind of flexible options in terms of how people train and especially with um, potentially people later on in life that have changed their mind and decided to be wanting to be teachers. I could not imagine now training to be a teacher with the family at home and trying to do all that teach training and i know people that are in that situation that are doing that um and hats off to them because that's really tough but i think as a profession we need to kind of adapt and make it more welcoming and more 
kind of adaptable for people's scenarios. Yeah, definitely. It's it's it sort of feels like we're on this kind of sprint speed to try and get people through that training and through the ECT years at super pace. Um, and and when I think about my own experiences starting my career, uh, that those that first year uh, as an NQT and the training year before it were probably the two toughest years that I ever had. And a lot of it's just down to the fact you haven't got this bank of experience that you build up over time of, you know, the, the you know, oh, I know how I taught this lesson last time. I know these bits that worked and these bits that didn't. All the little instincts you develop around behavior management and building relationships with children, um, that it, it builds up over time. Um, and it seems to me, you know, all the more reason to take time to build that up um, before you kind of try and, you know, try and run with it and, and, and um, do the, the, the full time job at, at full, full pelt. Um, if I could turn back and, and start again and, and ease myself in more gently, I'd absolutely do that. And I think I'd become I'd have become a lot more successful um, in, the, in the sort of medium term sooner for, for, for having sort of taken time to, to do that. Uh, the, the other thing I'm really conscious of, and it, I'm, something I'm saying to my trainees already, is that when you're on that 80% teaching, teaching load and you're very early in your career, it gives you so little time to actually reflect on, on each lesson that you've taught and how it went. And um, it's been great for these first few months of the year working with my trainees at kind of kind of going into detail with the lessons and really drilling down to what worked why did that help you know what why did that thing there go wrong the the value that you get out of those discussions and being that forensic about your own practice is huge particularly early in your career and it feels like we're not going to give the trainees as much time as I'd like to be able to give them to do that in the in the second half of the year because they're on this kind of uh, you know accelerated route towards you know build up your stamina so that you're ready to take on a full-time ECT timetable um, from September. And it's 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 that thing isn't it that I feel like when you get to that 80 percent of your training you're almost surviving as opposed to thriving you're not slowing down and reflecting and um able to develop your craft you are kind of it's so fast paced so much to get in uh, and get done it's it becomes this really difficult thing and i and certainly as well from the mentor side so i've been a mentor with uh, three or four different uh training organizations but um i know some schools can give um mentors extra uh time on their timetable but i didn't so um i'm always having to give up my fr one of my frees every week um, and then it's it's always more than that. But I wish I had more than that. I wish I as a mentor had the time to slow down and spend that time or even having a whole afternoon once a week where you actually get to kind of really dissect it. Because I feel like an hour a week to kind of dissect all their lessons and then work on their targets and, and pr plan their next bit um, just isn't enough time either. No, totally agree with that. And I think, you know, to be honest, the same goes for experienced teachers as well. I'd, I'd really like to see a situation where more teachers had more time protected in their timetable to be reflective and to think about and talk about and explore practice with other teachers. One of the things that my uh, my head teacher and I put in place at my um, last school uh, was we kind of built in, we changed our approach to performance management. We, we, we moved towards a model of kind of professional growth and development instead. So we took a way kind of the target setting the the appraisal meeting where you check your numerical targets and that side of things and we moved to a model where we would give staff um, an opportunity to kind of set their own targets um, you know within within sort of bounds that worked uh, with, within the school's whole school priorities and things but then we'd also build in time for them to have um, to do that so you know the way we worked is we had some additional um, PE release time where our PE coaches would come in and take one of the classes for an, hour, uh, an extra hour that week so that that teacher would have the opportunity to go and work with a colleague in another class either observing their lesson with them or you know looking together at some aspect of curriculum development um and it was it was fantastic because what it did was it created um professional conversations and professional development conversations as just part of the normal process of the week's work in school and it, it gives people the opportunity to come off the kind of the the treadmill survival mode where you just kind of head down and getting through the week and it, it specifically prompts them to 
get, take take their head out of the of, of that and, and think in in a different way about their practice and sort of stand back and have a look at it um, and I mean obviously it's resource intensive it costs money to do that sort of thing but it, you know if I if I had a magic wand that I could give more money to the schools around the country that's exactly the sort of thing I'd like to see more of happening because I think the um, the impact on the quality of the teaching that happens would be great but more than that the 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 impact we'd see on how teachers felt about themselves and their practice would be huge because there's nothing more motivating than the sense that you're getting better at something um, and uh, if there's one thing that those professional conversations can do it's give you that sense that you are consciously improving um, and and you know feeling that sense of progress in your I love that um I um my second school that I worked in um were very much like that you'd kind of set targets and then you would they would kind of pay you up and maybe you'd go and watch a teacher that that had said that they were good at that and said when they were doing that like if you wanted to go see questioning it'd be kind of like you send out an email to staff and be like oh who did anybody doing questioning and we'd pop in and it was this really nice kind of open door culture where you'd pop in kind of watch the lessons maybe with an, another colleague and you'd discuss kind of what you'd seen and then you'd go back and try it in your class and then you'd feed back to that teacher like oh I really like what you did I tried that with my class this is what happened and it was this really nice kind of positive shared experience and it was nice because it was out of department from a secondary point of view like I'd go watch languages or or maths or PE and it was and it was really nice that we kind of got to see and and bond and professionally with um other members of staff around around the school as opposed to observations and and learning walks being this really big scary pressurized thing of people coming into your room and suddenly your back goes stiff and your, your hairs go on end and, and you panic that I was then after that very comfortable I found it very weird moving to another school where people didn't come into my classroom um, it just felt a very natural kind of organic thing that mentally meant that like if when officer turned up I was like yeah I want them in my room I'm quite used to it like go on dare you like I'm quite happy for you to come wander into my room and ask my kids questions like they're used to it um and it was just it just made it a more natural experience and it made it kind of what we wanted it to be um so I definitely agree in terms of there needs to be more of that kind of collaborative thing and I know I've just said the big O but I think I I completely agree when when they were debating the the strikes originally um, and talking about that and and I think somebody put up a survey um about kind of um striking for pay and and granted my mortgage gone up considerably I would love to be paid more um but for me the big thing was is I would I would wholeheartedly strike till the end um if it was for more PPA time I would strike I would be more inclined to strike for that than for money like for me having more PPA time as teachers just benefits teacher well-being it benefits the school it benefits the students because you, you they're just going to get better quality lessons because they're going to get fresh more invigorated lessons and i just think that is that is the golden ticket that if the government can kind of understand that actually if they give more ppa time to schools um then i think more teachers will stay and the education will get better yeah i completely agree and it uh, it sort of um that I, the model you're talking about of, of um, having that kind of open door approach is just so much more um, refreshing and invigorating to be part of than the one that I spent most of my career with, which was this idea that you'd be observed, you know, maybe once a term by a senior leader in a high stakes way that had a graded judgment attached to it that then fed into your performance management. Everything about that is high stakes and high pressure, and it totally incentivizes the wrong things. It incentivizes you to kind of look at how you can put on this show lesson to impress, how you can kind of um, you know show that you're using all of the you know school's policies in the way that the you know the leader who's coming in will want to see them employed, and it doesn't encourage this kind of approach of of, of open-minded inquiry about practice. 
um, it, it sort of sits within this structure of a really hierarchical model where the person at the top knows best about how it should work in all of the classrooms with all of the children and their kind of you know quality assuring that everybody below them in the chain is doing their bit to make that happen and I really strongly believe that um, you know the real experts about learning are the people who are there in the class with the children every day they're the people who are going to have the most of value to say to others about you know what they could try and what they could explore and I think when you create opportunities for um, sort of peer observation and and just just spending time in other people's classrooms in a, in a low stakes way that's not attached to any judgment it's not attached to you know any any conversations around performance management or appraisal it's just a chance for you to go and be curious about how learning happens um, and I don't know about you but I certainly find I've, I've my practice developed as a teacher an awful lot when I, I got to a position where I got to go and observe other people teach um, because I realized that for for quite a few of the first few years of my career I hardly had a chance to go outside of my own classroom and see what it was like anywhere else and suddenly seeing things happening in other people's classroom opened my eyes to the sort of range of different things I could be trying should be trying um, and massively helped me develop as a teacher so that's I, you know I, I think we need to be affording teachers more opportunities to go and you know watch others teach um, you know as, as well as be seen. Oh, I completely agree. I'm always like to, to for all students that are doing kind of practical, I'm like go watch the food tech teacher because they're going to be the, the kids have got knives. So that teacher is going to be the strictest person on a practical you will see. Um, and I always send them to go and watch watch them. But I, I quite like a pupil trail as well. I love kind of go and be a pupil, go follow that pupil and just see how different teachers react with that student and how that student reacts differently to different teachers um I'd, and that kind of really opened my eyes as a trainee and I'd, I still make my trainees do it and I just think it's just a really interesting practice to do yeah definitely yeah and um, uh, one of the interesting things I've found in this new role is the opportunity I'm having now to, to spend much more time in secondary schools than I've ever had um, because uh, you know a couple of my trainees are secondary based um, and so I've got secondary teachers who are helping uh, with the, the sort of lead mentor side of things in terms of subject knowledge and I'm there to help them kind of think about the, the broader pedagogies that can, can work across both but for me having the opportunity to go and spend time in secondary schools and see how different Different, the learning experience can be with different teachers and different classrooms has been um, has been fantastic um, and again something I wish I'd had more of earlier in my career um, you know the, the chance to go and see what learning looks like in these other contexts outside of the primary school one that I was so familiar with. And I, and I will say if if you uh, want to upskill your pedagogy um, or even if you're a trainee looking for somewhere to find some information, our lovely sponsors, John Cat Educational, have some great books that are well worth a read. Um, you can use our discount code JCTTR2324 for 20% off as well. So do go and visit their website and have a look at what uh, books they've got, because that's my favourite thing to do is read up the, about different pedagogies and then go see what other people are doing in a similar um, frame and how I can kind of bring it into my classroom. Um, but I guess moving on to being um getting into teacher training and kind of putting that different hat on did it take a lot of adapting from kind of being in that school environment to kind of stepping back and only really popping into schools yeah um it, it's definitely different um and and i like it but there are some things that i miss about it and and i think the um the main thing that i really kind of um bugs me is I go into schools and I think I don't know these children's names I don't know anything about their lives and I've been used to spending my whole career in schools where I know the name of every child in the school I know their siblings I know their families I know which football team they're into I know what their hobbies are um, I really really miss that that kind of connection you 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 build with children when you work in the same place um, and and dotting in and out of schools as great as it's been for kind of um, you know helping me kind of explore different pedagogies and uh you know help trainee teachers see different ways of teaching and 
and, and all the enjoyment I get out of helping people develop their teaching. I do really miss that. Although I had one lovely moment last term where I, I went into one of my schools, and I think this was perhaps maybe the fourth time I'd visited that school. Um, and as I walked down the corridor, one of the children just sort of said to me, oh, hi, Mr. Roebuck. And I thought, oh, yes, I had such a good feeling inside, that kind of warm feeling of, of feeling like, I, no, I, I, I am building myself as part of this um, this organisation here, that, you know, the children are starting to get to know me a bit and things. Um, but yeah, that was quite a bit of a culture change for me um, in terms of that. The other thing was I was sort of slightly worried about um, how I would do with kind of managing my own time and not being on the, you know, not being on a school timetable. I've been used to working within these sort of rigorous time, span, time bounds of, you know, knowing what time I had to be there on the door to greet the children in the morning and what time I was going to be there for break duty and, you know, meetings that I was going to have in between. And, and suddenly I have this kind of blank canvas of a calendar where I can pick and choose what goes where um, and that took a little bit of getting used to as well at first just kind of um, and, and, and getting past the kind of guilt of feeling like I'm you know if I'm not being really productive in every minute I'm doing something wrong um, but actually I think that's much more akin to how most people work you know as a teacher if you're kind of feeling a bit of brain drain and unfocused you can't just down tools and go and have a cup of coffee and read a newspaper or something you need to be there in the moment with the class that you're teaching but actually in the role I'm in um, you know unless I'm in the middle of delivering a seminar or something if I'm starting to zone out a little bit and switch off I can go and take a walk and, and you know stroll down to the park and grab a coffee coffee and uh, and once I sort of accepted that no this is an okay and normal way of working that's also been really refreshing and, and great for my well-being I feel much more in in, in control and, and the master of what I'm doing rather than as a deputy head that I'd have some days where I'd describe it as feeling like a tornado would sort of pick me up and just whirled me around and I was you know constantly you know in firefighting mode and on the back foot reacting to things um, this role I'm, I'm much more kind of on the front foot and and feeling more in control of things and that's that's quite i i hadn't thought about it that way because i i always i i do the typical thing of when people ask about teaching or go oh but you have 14 weeks off a year um i go but but i do five presentations a day they're they're all presentations that i've prepped and planned and and i have to stand up and deliver them to 30 uh, teenagers and get them to engage and do work and develop them and then I have to mark them and then adapt and plan the next presentation whereas you probably will have a month and do one presentation it's not quite the same intensity and I think that's the thing with teachers we are very much kind of strung to work at this really high intensity that we kind of forget how to especially in the holidays as well we find it hard and weekends find it hard to switch off kind of stop and and slow down and I think that's that's I'm I'm finding that weird in my role, just going from a head of department to a non A time, and I'm I'm kind of a bit like I don't know what to do with myself. I've I've taken it upon myself to find all the kids that are non attenders that do my subject, and I'm I'm slowly getting them back into school. I've already got one that comes and spends an hour with me uh, once a week um, and does some work, and it's the first time she's been in school for a long time. So I already feel like I'm putting my PPA to good use and and uh, finding other uses for it. Um, but I think it, it's it is difficult, isn't it, as teachers to slow down? And like you said, we're kind of used to running on empty, but doing a good job whilst running on empty, um, as opposed to actually doing. A better job being more full i guess yeah it's a real sort of feast and famine model the way the teaching year goes isn't it where you have these kind of intense periods uh, in the term time and then suddenly you drop at the, the half term and it, or you know i've never failed to um fall ill in october half term whenever i've changed school or started in a new setting it's like my body kind of holds on to that point to see you through to the end of term and then it just collapses um and i've seen that with my trainees as well this year you know so many of them were kind of falling ill at the start of a holiday or you know at the end of a half term period and things because um the intensity of it just um it, it kind of where where's your immune system down doesn't it uh, and I do I do find myself wondering if you know again if you could move away from a model where teachers are so intensely focused on being there teaching every minute of every day all of the time how much more we'd get out of our teachers if they had a little bit more time and space in their week um, and, and weren't under the intense pressure that, that they so often are um, you know 
well-being, health, health um, all of these benefits that um, you know I, I'm certainly feeling being in a role that doesn't require that of me anymore. Um, but equally, my you know my level of performance when I do feels that much better because uh, you know I'm coming to it refreshed and recharged. The other time in my career I really noticed that is when I moved from my first school uh, after two, I, I did my uh, NQT year and my second year there uh, to my second school and the two schools had such a radically different culture around work um, that I, you know, my jaw sort of dropped because I'd been used to in this first school this incredibly um, draining, you know, and I look back now and think what a toxic culture it was. But, you know, I'd get there at sort of half past six in the morning and I wouldn't go home until gone 6 p.m. at night and I'd still be doing work in evenings and weekends and things. And it was almost like it was a competition there to see who was working the hardest, who was doing the most for these kids. Um, and then moving to my, my second school, I can remember saying to the head teacher, oh, you know, I, I normally work work on till after six in the evening she said, oh, you won't be able to do that here the, the caretaker will be rattling his keys by half past five you'll have to get out and I thought to myself oh my god what am I going to do but actually I found shortening my working day down made me a better teacher because I was so much fresher when I was in front of the children it more than made up for you know any any time that I might have spent sort of thinking further about you know different ways I was going to differentiate a lesson or you know extra things I was going to put in, bring into the planning um, sometimes less is more and we're more effective doing less really well than we are trying to do lots I completely agree with that last statement I think there's a um, there's I can't oh, I can't remember the technical term there's a technical term where if you give yourself one hour to do something you'll take one hour but if you give yourself two hours the same task will take two hours it's all about kind of giving yourself the amount of time and I always tell my trainees that one it's like get, give yourself a shorter amount of time because as teachers we will fill the time in every single capacity and over complicate and, and try and make it the perfect lesson but the reality is actually when you go teach it, the lesson you think you've planned out to the dot and is absolutely beautiful and going to be exquisite will be the lesson that will end up on its arse. And as opposed to the lesson that you've not put as much in and is maybe more simple could end up being the most perfect lesson. Um, so it's quite kind of interesting in terms of how teaching can work. We can quite often overextend ourselves unnecessarily. And I also, uh, in terms of the well-being, I had my, um, I'm a, I was a subject uh, expert at my old trust and I had uh, five trainees come in for their first day um, and other stuff was on the schedule, but it was quite, it was like talking about assessment. I was like, this is the first, they ha you haven't even been in a school. I don't need to tell you about assessment. Um, I was, and I was like, we're doing something else. And I was like, right, I'm going to give you the nitty gritty. I'm going to give you the things you need to know. I was like the things you need to know is in the winter you need to take your vitamin T tablets because you're not going to be outside in the daylight. You're here. Uh, B, you need to eat your body's weight in garlic or ginger. And I would also recommend some kind of green powdered shake and just make yourself as healthy as possible and boost your immune system because you're going to be introduced to a whole new uh, realm of germs. And, and I like to think as well with moving schools, I literally have made sure without doubt I've had my greens every day. And, and I like to think that's the reason that I, fingers crossed, Touchwood, haven't been sick yet since uh, joining there, despite it being rapid kind of flu season. Um, and I just think we have to look after ourselves and you have to, like you said, those people that power through and come in and actually you're either going to make yourself sick or everybody else sick that's at school and the same as as lovely as those government posters were that like oh they had stomach ache but i sent them in anyway and now they're fine it could have ended up being diarrhea and spreading it around the whole entire school so um as much as i know that attendance is important i also don't want the government pushing kind of ill students into school and making all teachers kind of ill we seem to be at the bottom of the list in terms of priorities for health i guess yeah, it sometimes feels like we're the um, we're the kind of uh, you know na national babysitting service, and the government's happy just as long as we're kind of keeping keeping the children occupied during the day, so everyone else isn't disturbed in their daily working lives and things. Um, no, it's it's so true. Look, looking after our health is so important, and I think looking after our mental health as well. Um, and there was something you were saying before that made me think about this kind of um, you know I, I, I um, as a, as a teacher and also as a parent we can feel this real sort of moral imperative to be the best that we can possibly be. But there's a really important concept to keep hold of is being good enough 
good enough is is good you know and it's it's hard to sometimes to feel like you are being good enough there's always more you could do to be better but sometimes you've just got to say i've done enough now today to make that next lesson good enough that that's okay and i'm okay with that and i can step away from that and again that's been a big piece of learning for me through my career sort of moving away from this idea that i have to make every lesson perfect to accepting that no lesson is ever perfect um and it's better to be kind of keeping yourself healthy on an even keel and steadily teaching lessons that are good enough over the year that's going to have a much better impact on children long term than um you know you burning yourself out and not being great in great condition for the last couple of weeks of a half term or whatever or you know in in the worst cases you know having to go off on sick leave or um you know, whatever because you, you're not able to keep up with the pace of what's required um yeah so good good enough good enough is good enough is um you know something i try and impress on people that i work with in my training. are there any other kind of big differences that you see in terms of kind of moving into teach training um or are there any other kind of roles or people that you've worked with that you feel could work for teachers in terms of better work-life balance or anything that you felt that you did in particular within your career that would uh, prepare you for that role so you've got a better chance of kind of getting it on interview or things like that that if people are kind of considering those things because they're because you don't necessarily Although we naturally get the experience in the classroom, but there's there's other skills involved within teach training as well. Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, sort of school school leadership is is a, a great proving ground for all sorts of other things. And when I started thinking about applying outside of schools, it was apparent to me that my skill set and the experiences that I'd had being a deputy head was so wide ranging that there was lots of kind of options open to me. Um, and particularly if you're kind of proactive in, you know, trying to get yourself involved in different parts of school life. So I, you know, I started out um, as a school leader and, and often I was, uh, you know, doing the data and the, the spreadsheets and things like that. And I continue to do that throughout my career in leadership, but I very deliberately tried to branch out and, you know, have a year where I would take on leadership of a different curriculum subject or I would, you know, guide subject leadership more widely and I'd take on a role developing middle leaders or I would look at curriculum development and I would um, you know have some time where I focused on that um, or I would look at um, you know professional development and uh, you know staff meetings and teacher training and how those things were used um, and uh, uh, the other thing I did I was a local authority moderator for um, key stage one um, which was a really interesting experience as well. And all of these things just sort of um, widened my portfolio, I guess, of things that I was starting to feel comfortable with and had experience of doing and, and, and felt that I had sort of results that I could show. Um, and so when I, when I came to the point of applying for jobs outside of school and I'm putting together my kind of personal statement, I'm thinking about what I want to share at interview, I felt like I had an awful lot of things at my fingertips that I could kind of refer back to, experiences that I could draw on, um, specifically for teacher training, obviously a lot of the stuff that I'd done around professional development with the staff team, stuff I'd done around kind of um, induction for new members of staff to a school, um, helped me really think about that process of inducting people to the teaching profession in a more general sense um so yeah i suppose adv advice to others just yeah bro broaden your broaden your horizons as and when you've got the, the the opportunities to do that you know seize those opportunities and try different things out don't you know don't get stuck doing the same thing that you've always done year on year it, going back to that thing that you said before about kind of personal um development and targets i know that you said that you made them slightly more relaxed in your school i i certainly don't agree with like data driven targets and things like that i think it's just too much pressure on things that are out of your control um but do you think we need to have like kind of in those kind of sessions more of like a personal kind of conversation about kind of do we need to know more about what is going on our, in our staff's lives and kind of what um they kind of want out of their personal things because i think sometimes it's it's one of those you can you might think that um the teacher that leaves dead on the dot at three o'clock is switched off but actually they're just running to have, they want to have that quality time with their family um or as opposed to the person that's here at seven o'clock every night that doesn't go home do they need actually some kind of support in in working less and managing their workload and going home and it it's like do we need to 
almost add in that more of a, a personal mental do we need a, I th- that's that's probably where i'm going with this actually do we need to make sure because we've got those kind of professional targets that are always more kind of like your professional development your de- kind of department target um or your pedagogy target do we need a bit of a well-being target kind of added in to teachers professional development to make sure that we as a teaching body and and as a school are kind of looking after our staff and kind of considering where they're at as well yeah i think i think there's a lot in that um i mean there's obviously a a line to walk between you know making sure people have got a right to their you know privacy of their their private home life and things and not feeling like they have to share if they're not comfortable with that but by the same token when i think about um people that I've worked with over the years people who've been brave and willing enough to be open about their own lives and have let me in on that has massively helped me understand them as a person and understand what their needs are and and what will help them so you know I'm thinking for example of a teacher I work with who you know was quite open that she'd had some issues around anxiety and depression um, and that really helped me understand times where maybe she was looking a bit disaffected or what you might think would be bored actually no it's not that at all actually she's just you know that's the she, she's not in the, the the mental place to present as as happy and cheerful though that doesn't mean that she's not able to be effective and things um and i can think about you know times where people have um felt they're in a culture where they can be open when they're struggling leads to better outcomes for for solving problems and getting past things so you know i'm thinking about someone that i know who was really deeply unhappy in a in a a setting that they were in and because they were sort of brave enough and open enough to come and talk about that with people we were able to look at a solution to kind of change that setting and and um you know make a move and, and that that's led to them being vastly more successful happy and on a much better trajectory um but i think to get there you've got to you've got to create a culture where where people feel that's okay it's okay to talk about these things and to be open about that and that they're not going to be negatively judged for having a weakness or something it's it's not a weakness it's part of all of our lives we have things that put pressures on us and make life difficult for us and if we can be open about those and talk about them it helps the people around us to bring out the best in us and be the best we can be i i think that's very well put and i think um like you said sometimes it's just having that open and honest place where people can be honest and make sure they feel secure and i think it's it's the same i think i think it's a bit of a british thing isn't it with mental health we suck it up and we we keep it to ourselves and we just carry on um and especially with kind of being mental health week uh, this week and getting kids to kind of open up and consider um kind of their mental health i think it's important that we do it with teachers as well um in your in your role as a senior leader at various points do you feel that there's um a good way to kind of get a staff voice and find out how staff are feeling as a, as a collective because sometimes it can just be one or two people but sometimes it could be that something is generally or the workload or the school it could just end up being just the time of the year do you think there's a good like amount to kind of ask staff in times of um kind of surveys or do you just do it kind of once a year how much does that kind of go into SLT's kind of decisions in terms of school or do you think it, it's more of a kind of as it comes up kind of thing? I'll, I'll be honest Hannah I'm not sure that I've ever quite got this right in my different school leadership roles because um, you, you want to get that balance between um, you know getting the information you need from people at a time where you can make use of it and normally that's kind of you know in the moment or but with I guess with bigger whole school issues like you know is this particular policy having a huge impact on workload that's that's negative for people um, you know you, you don't want to wait for the annual survey to come round to know that to hear that but um, I've also found that it's uh, it can be quite difficult to get staff to come and, and feel it's OK to be open about that and be critical about that because they they often have a sense that senior leaders are really invested in these policies. They put a lot of work into them. They presented them. There's been a bit of a three line whip, perhaps, to say, no, this is the way we're going to do it. And it can then feel, I think, a bit intimidating to go and say, do you know what? The, the, it sounded like a great idea, but it's not actually working. And I, one of the things I've really struggled with is kind of um, finding ways of letting staff know that I am completely okay with them saying that, that it's okay for them to come and tell me this is really terrible idea and it's not working. I'd much rather you tell me that now 
um, so we can look at making a change to it than wait, you know, six weeks until everybody's absolutely tearing their hair out and it, it, people are reaching breaking point. Um, surveys on their own aren't going to do that, but having surveys is important because it means that, you know, you do have a set point in the year where you're going to take that um, take that feedback and take the temperature and, and, and see if there are any kind of general trends thing and, uh, there. But, um, yeah, b building that culture of... Um, two-way openness and and it's okay to be critical is tricky and, and that's especially so because sometimes as senior leaders you know you need staff to all sign up to something that maybe not all of them fully believe in and and actually but to, for, for a, a whole school policy or approach to be effective it does need everyone to be bought, bought in and doing it and so that means a few people are going to feel that they're rubbing it it's rubbing against the grain for them um, and they might be the ones who in in a culture where things are very open are, are quite quick to come and you know um have a have a complaint and a moan and then you can end up in a in a i guess a, a moaning culture where um you know everybody's always looking for the negative thing that uh that, that's wrong in what they're doing it's really really difficult to get that balance between um you know w agreeing that we're going to work together on something even if we're not all perhaps 100 percent behind it versus having the openness to be able to say this isn't working and can we can we look again at this versus not you know having a, a culture where everybody's always talking about what's going wrong for them all of the time um yeah sorry a bit of a wide-ranging answer and, and no magic bullet there i'm afraid but yeah it's one i one i still struggle with no and and um i had uh brian walton on uh last week talking about his uh book which was uh the secret of the head's office um, and he quite openly kind of talks about that there's moments where he's gone and kind of cried in the toilet and uh, various different things and the pressures and stuff of being in leadership and as I'm, I'm doing my leadership masters at the moment and the thing I'm noticing when I talk to lots of senior leaders is that um, that I didn't necessarily until like the last few years necessarily appreciate as a teacher but how much gets passed up to you lot and how much pressure gets put onto you and kind of that kind of like who looks after senior leadership ships mental health and kind of who kind of looks after their well-being and that kind of thing like if if a senior leader kind of works from home for half a day it's like oh they're not in school today um or they're not wandering around and doing that like how do you kind of make sure that senior leaders are looking after themselves and each other and but also kind of do it in a way that kind of staff can be respectful of it i think you need you need a team of people around you that, that you know you can go to and i've been really lucky to work with head teachers who've just been fantastic at being um empathic and allowing me space when i've needed to come in and close the door and just say ah oh, i can't believe what's just happened and and kind of vent um, because I'd always sort of saw one of the key parts of my role as a senior leader, leader in school was to kind of provide stability and reassurance to people when things were going wrong. So whenever I was around and about in school, whatever was happening, I'd try to be presenting this sort of serene sense of calm and confidence to reassure people that we would be okay through the crisis. And sometimes inside my head, I'm absolutely screaming and thinking this is completely out of control or what are we on earth is going on? Or, you know, sometimes having an emotional reaction to something that's made me feel really angry with somebody and having to kind of the effort it takes to keep that serene, calm demeanor can be huge sometimes. And it definitely takes its toll on you. The th it, it, that ability to go into a room and just close the door and just have someone there with you that you know it's okay to let rip with um, is is hugely helpful. And I'd like to think that as a deputy, I've been that person for my head teachers as well. I think it's one of the reasons why I haven't gone to headship, to be honest, is this sense that actually once you get to that point, there isn't anybody else other than your senior leaders who you're, you've got a duty to look after as much as everyone else. There isn't anyone there in the school on the day whose responsibility it is to look after you. But if you've got a senior leadership team that looks after each other, that can be really helpful. Um, but you, you do need, you know, you, you need to maintain that kind of um, confidence and calm presence around the rest of the school because the last thing anybody wants is a sense that their senior leaders are falling apart at the end of their tether overworked you want them to feel that they've got capacity to help you if you need that help and that they're confident that they know what they're doing and they're guiding the guiding the ship the school in the right direction um but it's it's such a stressful and high pressured role that you you definitely need um those valves those sort of pressure release valves 
Um, the other thing I got better at over the time is is just kind of taking things less personally and the more kind of difficult situations I found myself in, whether that was with a parent who had their hackles up and was being really aggressive or a child who had completely lost control and was unreachable. The more times you've been in that situation and you've lived through it and you came out the other side and it was okay and things got better, the easier it is to kind of exist in that moment and not feel completely overwhelmed by it. I think when... um, you know a little bit like when you first step into teaching from not having taught the culture shock of the intensity of it there, there's definitely elements of that when you move into senior leadership as well where you're suddenly dealing with issues that before you would have thought oh i'm going to call the assistant head to deal with this one now and suddenly you're the assistant head and you you're the person who's got to deal with it and, and it's going to be your first time dealing with some of these situations it does get easier just like um you know teaching gets easier in the classroom as you build up that bank of experience to and kind of on the work life balance have you got some non negotiables or have your non negotiables changed were they different when you were a deputy to when uh, your new role have you got certain things that it's like right i don't work after this time uh, i don't check my emails on weekends what are your kind of non negotiables to help you with your work life balance so I'm not sure that I'd say anything I've got is completely non negotiable there's always a little bit of wriggle room when it's right but um I, there are some things that I will absolutely do. So one of them is um, when I get to about probably 6 p.m., I make sure that the work phone is switched off and away um, and, and often before that as well. And I, I do not have my work email on my personal phone um, or at least, you know, I, I, if I had I could if I needed to, I could get there through the browser or whatever. But it's not pinging me with notifications and things. Likewise, at the weekend, I don't open my work computer. I don't turn on my work phone. I'm not going to do any work. I'm working part time at the moment. So I have one day a week where I don't work. And as a general rule, I will not do anything on that day. However, I've had to be a bit flexible on that at times uh, where, you know, let's say I need to fit in some observations of trainees or whatever. And that's the only date that works because their mentors got a trip on a day. You know, things happen. So but what I've always done in that case is I've always made sure that if I work on that day, I will make sure I take another day in a future week where I say, okay, I'm not going to work that day um, in return. So, for example, this last week I worked the whole week or five days. This Today was my last day of working for this week and, and tomorrow and Friday I'm, it's just going to be family time for me to be with the kids. So kind of being disciplined with that calendar management of saying, um, you know, I will make myself available if I absolutely have to be at these other times. But generally speaking, I've got this kind of basic time time schedule that I will work with as well Um, and the other thing I I think is a self-discipline thing more than anything else and again I got better at it the longer I've been um, working in schools is genuinely switching off from work when I'm not working so if I get to the end of the day and I close down that laptop and put my phone away making sure that I don't think about whatever the issue or the problem that's been I've been working on is there in my mind and I think that can be quite hard to do Um, And I certainly found it much harder to do um, earlier on in my career. But um, yeah, again, I I guess, you know, that realisation that I I better serve the people that I'm supporting and helping by being fresh, by being switched on and by being refreshed when I'm with them. um, You know, that's the better way to serve them than to be thinking about them in the evening when there's nothing I can practically do to actually, you know, help with the situation or make anything better or losing sleep at night over it or whatever. So I guess it's, yeah, that, that kind of self-discipline of of allowing yourself to forcing yourself to switch off and and, and avoid thinking uh, work. I, I, I certainly, I remember meeting a teacher quite early on in my career who worked four days a week and she was like, I need the day off to be able to do the work. Otherwise I won't, otherwise it will happen at my weekend. And I, it's it's it stuck with me and I think it is it is that teaching thing isn't it there's so much to do and we can we could work every minute of every day and we'd never be done but it's really important to have that discipline of stopping when it's important to stop and switching off when it's important to swap stop and and just kind of giving yourself that time and I think that time in lieu as well is really important as well so I think if you are asked to do things in school as well that are outside of your normal teaching hours and over your kind of contracted hours uh, make sure you ask for that that back because quite often schools can add things in and then, then they put you over your hours and actually don't think about kind of 
doing that and I think that's if, if you've got a good senior leadership team then they'll kind of go if we're adding this in we'll take this away and you'll get the time back here um but I think that's certainly something if you are in a leadership role to consider to make sure that you're doing mindfully yeah and if I can come in there as well Hannah it's if if, if the leaders are being proactive in having in saying that to their staff that is massively helpful at setting that so the the trust I'm working for now they made it very clear from the start my direct line manager made it very clear from the start if you take it if you work an extra day I want you to make sure you take that day back at some point in the future and now every time that I do a week where I do an extra day or an extra bit she will always say to me you make sure you take that time off she doesn't leave it for me to ask she she proactively uh, you know asks me to do it and what that does for me is it makes me feel you know that my time is really appreciated it makes me feel that my work-life balance is genuinely appreciated it's not just my responsibility to worry about it manage it it's something that she is actively kind of doing and I think yeah as you say if, if senior leaders are communicating to that staff communicating to their staff that they value them and their work-life balance in that way um, it goes so far to making uh, that that kind of positive culture of it's okay to you know to ask and it makes me much more willing to be flexible as well because I know that you know if I am flexible I'm not going to feel like that day's just been snatched away and I'm never going to get it back I know that my boss is going to be there saying well you did five days last week what you know why are you still here now or, or whatever it, it's exactly that it's it's as teachers feeling appreciated we we will all gladly give our time to our students because they're important to us but it's we do it at a detriment to our own kind of health and work-life balance and and families and it's just important to have that balance so like kind of at the end of our kind of almost our hour and a half what is the best thing that you found with kind of switching up and having that um more present time at home um the best thing is the energy that i've got for my kids um they you know they're, they're both really active really lively children who are really demanding and they're very sociable and so if they're with me they want me to be with them like fully 100% they want me to play with them they want me to talk to them they want me to in, engage and interact with them and I can do that in this role in a way that I never felt I was fully able to all of the time outside of weekends and school holidays I think when I was in that school-based role um, and and you know when I, I you know I Moving to this role has been a, you know, I've taken a bit of a pay cut and, uh, you know, to some degrees, as you said, alluded to earlier, it's a sideways move rather than this kind of march up the ladder. But I've, I've sort of thought to myself in 10 years time, when I look back, am I, am I going to regret that? Or would I regret more not having had those that time with my children when they're young and I'm still, you know, youngish and 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 can enjoy it? Um, and yeah, just just kind of yeah, living living that experience of being a dad in its fullest way. Um, that no one's going to be able to take that away from me. Um, that's all kind of you know memories in the bank for for a happy future for me and for them. Oh, it sounds like such like a lovely kind of teaching success story and I, I wish you all your, the luck in your new role if you've joined us late on and you've missed any of the show you can listen back uh, shortly over on teachers talk radio or you can find us on spotify or your other listening platforms just search in teachers talk radio and give us a follow thank you so much for joining me tonight and i hope you have a lovely rest of your day this show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Introducing Eton X from Eton College, a diverse range of quality online courses enabling young people to aspire and excel. Designed for self-study, these web-based courses empower your students with essential leadership, communication and academic skills for success at school and beyond. Our study skills course sharpens their learning abilities, while the AI Fundamentals course equips them with vital digital know-how in a fast-changing world. 
other popular courses include verbal communication, critical thinking, writing skills, resilience, creative problem solving, and many more. Offer the Eton X curriculum in your school for free. Visit eatonx.com to find out more. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.